So in this section of Ask the Ancients, I want to go back to the same vein of our earlier conversation about sin. So what did the ancient rabbis say about same-sex relationships? Ah, uh, yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> the, so the rabbis were so you have to understand where they were right they're in they're in roman culture very close to greek culture um and uh they were looking at the verses in leviticus that say a man should not lie with a man as a man lies with a woman um and saying ah okay well same sex male relationships and eh? Of course, there's nothing in the Torah that talks about same-sex female relationships or prohibits them in any way. So they were a little bit iffy on that one. Like they, they kind of <laughs> wanted to prohibit it, even though it, there was no real reason to prohibit it. Um, but that is the direction things went. Now, I, there is a, I think there's a good argument to be made that what the Torah was saying and certainly how the rabbis understood what the Torah was saying was that uh, it was trying to prohibit hierarchical relation, sexual relationships. In other words, the kind of relationship that we know about from ancient Greece, for example, with a, a sexual relationship between an older man and a younger boy, where there was this, mm -hmm. this power dimension of the, of the relationship, and that they may have been referring to that in saying that that was analogous for them to what they knew of the power relationship between men and women, and that's what they were trying to prohibit. Um, but certainly the way the tradition went was to prohibit same-sex male relationships and prohibit slightly less vociferously same-sex female relationships. Mm -hmm. The place where that, uh, where people started changing on that was to look at another verse in the Torah, another, another, uh, well, just another verse in the Torah very early on, much earlier, not Leviticus, but in Genesis, when human beings are created, when God says that human beings are created in the image of God. And if people are created in the image of God, then that's like that bumper sticker that says God doesn't make mistakes, right? <laughs> um, so God, if, if pe people were created in God's image, some people uh, were created in, with an attraction towards people of the same sex, and some people were created with an attraction towards people of, of a different sex or different gender. And uh, that is the way God intended the world to be. So then that, as so often happens, one part of the Torah is now in tension with another part of the Torah. And how do we resolve that tension, right? So as people's understanding of uh, same-sex relationships has grown, uh, there has been in much of the Jewish world an understanding that, well, those prohibitions, whatever they were supposed to mean in Leviticus, can't contradict what we see in Genesis that applies to all of humanity, not just Jews or the Israelites. Um, and so we have to say that, you know, those those prohibitions are less are going to lose out in the battle of which part of the Torah is going to be ascendant. So throughout the Jewish world now, um, even in the Orthodox world, there's much more acceptance of same sex relationships. I wouldn't say, you know, that in I wouldn't say in the Orthodox world is that they're people are having same-sex weddings, but the idea that same-sex relationships exist, that um, that people's sexual orientation is something that is part of who they are, part of them as a human being created in the image of God is well accepted, and people still have trouble reconciling those specific verses in Leviticus with specific acts, you know, specific sexual acts, but the in general this idea as it has sort of in the general culture in the united states um it's become fairly well accepted that these relationships are you know exist and from i think for most of the jewish world would say these relationships are holy uh and they can at least can be holy um that same-sex relationships just as opposite sex relationships can be sanctified can have wedding ceremonies people can commit to each other that these are actually good relationships in which to create families. Um, that has spread across the Jewish world in a very short amount of time, just as it has across, you know, American sexual, secular culture in a very, very short amount of time. Um, I think one of the arguments I, I, is that people have said, if those verses in Leviticus are 
not verses that we are going to take maybe in the way that other people did in the past. Maybe we shouldn't even read them. Right? And this is an argument about lots of parts of the Torah. We have the tradition of reading through the Torah, the entire thing every year out loud and hearing all of these words. And some of these words are really disturbing to us. So to hear those words in Leviticus, are, that's really disturbing. Should we be saying those words? And I, I think in general, I fall along the lines of people who say, we have to say those words just in the same way that we have to confront our history and things, you know, acts of oppression and acts of lack of acceptance that we did in our history. We need to we need to do that. We we don't only read the Torah because everything in it, we're like, yay, it's not like a cheering <laughs> section about everything there. It also is meant to challenge us and to make us realize what um, where we need to push ourselves in terms of creating justice and compassion in the world today. So we still are reading those verses. Maybe we're not reading them as often. I'll just tell you that that uh, traditionally those verses were read on Yom Kippur. In addition to how they fall during the year, those verses were read in the afternoon service on Yom Kippur. Many congregations, including mine, have changed that practice and read different verses because although it's important to confront those verses, is it important to read them again on this day of the year when a lot of people are paying attention? Probably not. And we could be <laughs> concentrating on something else at that time um, other than these prohibitions that really don't speak to us anymore. So what do you read instead? Uh, we read uh, we read verses that are very close to those in Leviticus, mm -hmm. which is called the Holiness Code, which is how do you be holy? Mm -hmm. It's actually a really nice counterpoint, <laughs> I think, <laughs> in thinking about the holiness that's inherent in all kinds of relationships that we can have, um, because the holiness code really is not so much about you should be holy by offering this thing at the shrine. It's mostly you mm -hmm. should be holy by treating people fairly, by having compassion for other people, <laughs> by not trying to mm -hmm. say trick people or defraud people. So it, it is a nice way to fill that spot uh, on Yom Kippur afternoon with something that really speaks to how we, it really speaks to the change in, in how those relationships have been regarded from 2000 years ago <laughs> until, until today. Uh, and it's a really, of course, a really welcome change. And the, and the fact just for me personally, uh, as someone who knows and loves many people who are in same sex relationships, um, it's it's good to be in a place where we have a a growing consensus in the Jewish community that these relationships are also holy, just like other relationships that we know of.